A 35 gram cube of ice at negative 15 degrees C is placed into a soft drink, mostly water, that's at room temperature, 20 degrees C. The soft drink has a volume of 350 milliliters and a density of one gram per milliliter. Find the final temperature of the drink, assuming all the energy is exchanged between the ice and the drink, and that no energy is lost to the container or the surroundings. So initially, I have a chunk of ice and I've got some liquid. We're not worried about the container at this point. Now I'm going to put these two things together. Something's going to gain energy, something's going to lose energy. And we're trying to figure out what the final situation is going to be. Now some decisions to make. First of all, what are some of the possible outcomes that could happen? Here's one possible outcome. One is that the ice will melt completely and cool the drink down. Some of the heat would be required to warm the ice up to its transition temperature. Then there would be some heat that's required to melt the ice. And then there would be some heat that's required to warm whatever water that is produced by the ice up to the final temperature. All right, that's one possible outcome. If that happens, then the final temperature of the system is going to end up something between 0 degrees Celsius and 20 degrees Celsius. What's another possible outcome? Well, the other possible outcome is that perhaps there is sufficient ice there that all of the water that's at room temperature will be cooled down to 0 degrees. And the heat that's required to do that is going to come from the warming of the ice up to zero plus whatever melting that there's going to be. But if I've got some ice that's left over, then the final temperature of the system is going to be zero degrees C. Now, how can I figure out what the outcome is going to be? Let me suggest that let's figure out how much total heat is required to cool 350 milliliters down from 20 to zero for the liquid and compare that to how much heat's required to warm the ice up to zero and to melt the ice. Because the ice is going to be gaining heat, the liquid's going to be losing heat. Once we know what the outcome's going to be, then we can approach the problem and figure out what to do. So what I want to do is I want to compare how much heat has to be removed from the liquid in order to get it down to zero. Let's begin with that. The mass of 350 milliliters of the liquid, if the density is one gram per milliliter, is going to be 350 grams. That comes from the density formula. The C is going to be the specific heat of the liquid, and the delta T is going to be the 20 degrees. I end at zero, I start at 20, so the delta T in magnitude is going to be 20 degrees. Let's figure out how much heat that is. So now I'll put the numbers into the calculator. So if I were to cool this liquid from 20 down to zero, it would require the removal of 29,000 joules of energy. And what do I want to compare that to? Let's compare that to how much energy it takes to heat the ice and melt the ice completely at zero degrees. So I have a warming heat and I have a melting heat. Let's put the numbers in. Remember, I've got 35 grams of ice, and to warm it, it's going to be in the solid state. So now let me put in the numbers, and I get that it takes just under 13,000 joules to do that. So now, what I see is that I am going to melt all the ice, and the ice is going to turn into liquid and warm up a bit. Because the amount of heat that must be removed the 30,000, the 29,000 joules, is bigger than the amount of heat required to warm and melt the ice. Because those numbers are different, then I know that my final state is going to be liquid that's somewhere between 0 and 20 degrees C. So just repeating, because the heat required to cool the liquid to 0 is greater than the heat that can be melting and warming, warming the ice and then melting it, then I know that the ice is going to melt completely and then warm up to some final temperature. Something's going to gain heat. That's going to be the ice and the water that's produced from it. Something's going to lose heat. That's going to be the soft drink itself. And the heat loss plus the heat gain total is going to be equal to zero. I can write what the heat loss of the soft drink is. It's going to be MC delta T. The heat that's gained by the ice is going to be in three parts. Part is going to be to warm the ice up from negative 15 to zero. Part is going to be to melt the ice. 
in part is going to be to warm the water that results from the ice up to some final temperature. Now I've written one gigantic equation there. There are several ways you could solve this problem, but I'm going to do it according to this gigantic equation. So let me put the expressions in and then solve the problem. Gosh, what an awful expression this is. But let me t let you take heart. I know everything in this expression except TF. And TF appears in two places. It's right here and it's right there. I know what the mass of the soft drink is. I know what the specific heat of the soft drink is. And I know what the initial temperature of the soft drink is. That's all in this expression here. I know what the mass of the ice is, the specific heat of the ice. I know that the final temperature of the ice is going to be zero degrees because it's going to stop there to melt. And I know what the initial temperature of the ice is. I know everything in that expression. The, the mass of the ice and the heat of fusion of the ice. And I know everything except the final temperature in that expression. I know what the mass of the water that comes from the ice is. That's the 35 grams. Once that ice has turned into water, I know what the specific heat of it is. And I know what the initial temperature of the water was. It's zero degrees before it heats up. I'm going to put in all the numbers and then use my TI solve to solve this equation. Now, I could solve for TF. It would be an algebraic nightmare to do, but I'm just going to use TI solve to help me. Let's put in the numbers. So there's my long equation. Now, use TI solve, put in the numbers, and let's see what we get. Pay attention to this negative sign at the negative 15 degrees C. I find that the final temperature is 10.27 degrees C. Let's move on to the last example now. An experiment is performed to determine the heat of vaporization of water. Boiling water in a flask that has rubber tubing attached, as shown, generates steam. The tubing is inserted into a 70 gram aluminum calorimeter that gain contains 200 grams of water. The initial temperature of the calorimeter water system is 15 degrees C. The tube is placed in the water for a period of time and then removed. As a result of the steam condensing, the temperature of the water in the calorimeter increases by 45 degrees C. The calorimeter water system is remassed and it is found to have a mass of 281 grams. Determine the heat of vaporization of water and the percent error in the experiment. Wow, what a problem. Let's think our way through it. Our guiding principle is going to be the conservation of energy. Something's losing energy, something's gaining energy. There may be more than one thing that's gaining energy, and in this problem there is. So what's happening? The thing that's losing energy is the steam. It's going from 100 degrees steam, a gas, to 100 degrees liquid. So I'm condensing that amount of steam. Then that amount of water is cooling from 100 degrees down to 45 degrees. So that's what's losing energy. What's gaining energy? Well, the calorimeter is gaining energy, and the water in the calorimeter is gaining energy. And both of those things are warming up from 15 to 45 degrees. I'm going to approach this problem by figuring out how much heat is gained by the calorimeter and the 200 grams of water. That amount of heat is what is lost by the steam in condensing and in cooling. If I can figure out how much heat is lost by the steam during the condensing part, and I divide that by the mass, that's going to give me the heat of vaporization. So let me write the expression for the amount of heat gained by the cool water in the calorimeter. Since the calorimeter is made out of aluminum, I can look that up, the specific heat. I know what the mass of the water is that is warming from 15 to 45 degrees. And I can figure out what the change in the temperature is because I know what the final and the initial temperatures are. Let me put those numbers in. And now I'll put those numbers in my calculator and come up with a total amount of heat that is gained by the cool water and the calorimeter. I find that the cool stuff gains a total amount of heat of 27,090 joules. Where did that heat go? Well, that heat went to condense the steam and it went to cool the water that came from the steam down to 45 degrees from 100 degrees. Now, how do I know how much mass of the water that there was, mass of the steam? Mass of the steam 
this is going to be 281 grams, the total mass at the end of the experiment, minus the mass of the stuff at the beginning before the steam was added, which is 270 grams. So I have 11 grams of steam, and I have that that steam had to lose 27,090 joules. Part of it was lost during the condensation, and part of it was lost during the cooling. So if I can figure out how much energy was used to cool the water down, then what's going to be left is the amount of energy that was required to condense the steam. And since I'm looking for the heat of vaporization, which is the amount of energy that the steam loses per gram of steam, then that's going to give me my heat of vaporization. Let me figure out how much heat is required to cool the water, 11 grams of water from 100 degrees down to 45 degrees. So the amount required to cool it is MC delta T. Since I'm cooling from 100 degrees down to 45 degrees, then the change in temperature is going to be 55 centigrade degrees. So I find that it takes a little over 2,500 joules to cool 11 grams of water from its boiling point down to 45 degrees. So if I started with needing to remove 27,090 joules and I used 2,500 to cool the water, then what's left over must be what was required to condense the steam from gas to liquid. So let's figure out how much was required to condense the steam. So let me do the subtraction. And what I find is that I had just over 24 and a half thousand joules needed to condense the steam. Now I'm trying to find what is the latent heat of vaporization. Well, the latent heat is going to be the amount of heat per gram that's needed to make the transition. I used 24,549 joules. I had to remove that to condense 11 grams of steam. Now let's put in the numbers. I've got that the heat of vaporization is just above 2.2 million joules per kilogram. That's what I found in my experiment. All right, so now what's the accepted heat of vaporization? Well, look in table 42.1 to find what the accepted value is, and you find that it is 2260 times 10 to the third joules per kilogram. 2.260 times 10 to the sixth joules per kilogram. So now we need to find a percent error. Remember, percent error is the absolute value of the difference between the experimental and the accepted divided by the accepted times 100. So now let's put in the numbers. And let's put them into our calculator. I'm going to keep all the numbers that my calculator gave me to make the calculation. And I find that I get 1.25 percent error. Not bad for an experiment like this. So let's review. What we've done is we have figured out that during transitions, the temperature of a substance does not change. Many times methods of mixtures are used to figure out what heats are required, and you have to think your way through these problems and figure out what's going to happen as you approach and solve the problems. Sometimes the formulas are helpful, but you have to think your way through these problems, and that's a skill that you're going to need to develop. And so for now, that's it.